Good morning to everyone on Zoom. Thank you all for being here. We know that there's a lot of people who want to just talk to each other <laughs> and um, hope you can linger at the end and, and also catch up on with each other. But I want to welcome everyone and thank you all for being here for this very special event. Um, welcome you to the um, HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies, to all the HIV Center friends and family, um, and most importantly to the friends and family of Zena Stain who are here today um, for this, this special, um, special memorial lecture. And um, it's good to see so many of you in person. And we have many, many, many people on Zoom as well. So thank you all. Um, while we've had prior um, memorials and tributes to our dear beloved Zena um, since her passing, this is actually the first inaugural of an, what we want to be an annual grand round special event that will go on forever. <laughs> um, so I'll, thank you for this first one. And, and thank you so much to Dr. Mary Bassett for agreeing to do this, um, this commemorative rounds in, in the name of Zena Stain. Um, I think, as you know, I mean, Zena Stain was many things um, and beyond the HIV Center. But since this is an HIV Center hosted rounds, um, Zena was a founding co-director of our HIV Center back in the very dark days of the pandemic in 1987 when we started. And as you see pictured here are three founding co-directors, Anka Earhart, who is a sexuality and clinical psychologist and researcher, um, Bob Spitzer, who is a, a world leading psychiatrist and mental health expert, and Zena Stain, of course, a world renowned historian and epidemiologist. And um, these disciplines remain at the at the heart of what the center continues to be, um, focused on behavioral, the intersection of behavioral, medical, uh, and behavioral and social sciences of HIV prevention, treatment, and care. You'll hear more um, from our other speakers here today about the profound impact that Zena has had on many of us who are about to, from who, many of us who are here. Um, I'm slipping to say that from a personal perspective that Zena was a mentor, an inspiration, and a hero to me. And she strongly influenced the journey of my career. She remains in my mind and my heart, continuing to guide me in all that I do. And that, that's, I truly, truly mean that. <laughs> I think about Zena so much. And you know, it's always, what would Zena do? What would Zena say? How would Zena think about this? Um, because she's, well, you know, she's that person. And let me just transition here. And now that we have very recently um, had a successful seventh renewal, these are five-year cycle renewals, yes. <laughs> um, it, it's quite remarkable, actually, that, that centers like this continue to get renewed. It says something about, I think, who we are collectively. Um, and so we have this successful renewal just as of a couple of months ago of the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies, the same name from the start, under the leadership of Claude Mellons, Gina Wingood, and, and myself, and you'll hear from Claude and Gina in a minute, and of course our administrative cohort, Masood Rahman and Chris Ferraris, who help us run the center, and we have some center core directors here. Um, so, you know, we're an important family. Um, and I think that the theme that we have of our current renewed center, I see it as actually a continuing tribute to, to Zena um, with this focus on, on disparities and focus on social determinants of health. So that is who we are, that's who we started when we, the center first started, and that's who we are today. Um, I'd like to invite you all to a celebration of, the, of our new renewed HIV center on September 21st, Thursday at these same hours, 9.30 to 11. However, in the parties building, the NISPE parties building, where we have typically hosted our rounds, those of you who come over the years in the multi-purpose room, um, and we'll have a celebration event then. Um, and before moving on, I'd like to ask everyone in the room, I can't do it on Zoom, but just to simply raise your hand if you've, you've been a member of the center of a core or you're currently a member of the center of a core and, and that you're part of that HIV center funded family. So many of you in the room, thank you. And the cel thank you today and thank you on the, the celebration we have in a couple of weeks, it's for all of you. Um, and um, I would like to thank Zena 
family and close friends who made today's event happen. Thank you so much for participating and for being here. Um, I'd also thank, like to thank Melman for hosting this event in this beautiful Hess Commons room. Particular thank you to Kathy Zick, Sikama and Yasmin and to Simon and everyone on the team who helped make this happen and to Masood Rahman and Tanya Reed and Chris Ferraris who really helped just pull it all together for us. Um, and finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Mary Bassett. Um, she is a mighty force and leader in the world and thank you for agreeing to be here today at this inaugural Zena Stain event. Um, Mary is a long-term friend of our HIV Center and, of course, Columbia University. And um, as, as you will hear, a very close friend and person connected to Zena Stain. So thank you, Mary. I'd now like to turn the podium over to uh, my long-term colleague, Dr. Claude Mellons. Um, can I just say ditto to everything that Bob said? Um, it's uh, really quite wonderful to see you all here. Uh, I, I want to just do one other thank you in addition to the thank yous that Bob already did, which is, I think, Teo, you came up with the idea for this, right? Was there? Yes. So I want to thank you for that and to... Um, uh, for the idea of having an annual lecture that is dedicated to Zena and, and her work. Um, and I also want to thank the committee members um, who helped choose our esteemed speaker today, Louise Kuhn and, and Philip Kroniski, who I'm going to talk about in another second. So it's really quite wonderful to be in this space in the school that was one of Zena's other homes um, besides psychiatry and to uh, see everybody here and on Zoom. Um, it's also quite meaningful to me, as you heard from Bob, and I know to many of us who are here today um, to have our first center rounds um, and also the you know first center rounds of the year, as well as of our latest renewal, be dedicated to Zena. Um, Zena was, um, as you heard, not just the co-founder and co-director of our center, but she also was one of the founders and directors of our postdoctoral training program, um, which is really how I got to know her. And she became an incredible mentor to me in that capacity. I will say I was initially terrified of her. Some of you have heard me tell this story. The first time I gave her a paper that she was a co-author on with me, she told me it was utter rubbish. How many people had her tell them that before? <laughs> um, but over time, I learned in addition to her brilliant brilliance, there was kindness, compassion, capacity for giving and teaching and sharing that really defined who Zena was. Um, and so I would say in her older life, she really became another parent to me um, in so many ways. So Ezra, Ida and Ruth, thank you for sharing her with me, with many of us here today. And speaking of sharing, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Philip Kroniski, who will really tell us about Zena, which he's qualified to do, um, not only, I think, in a workspace, but he's also her grandson. <laughs> um, and he's a star in his own right. And I've had the honor of being a mentor and now colleague for the past six, seven years, something like that. Um, Phil's a developmental psychologist, a qualitative researcher, a graduate of the same T32 that I started out in, an NIMH-funded K-awardee. He's the PI of an R21. We are sadly losing him or have lost him to another institution. We won't say anything about that. Um, and so before we get to our main event today, we wanted to have someone bring to life the woman behind this name lecture. So, Phil. Thanks, Claude, and sorry, and everyone uh, who really pulled this together. Very kind words, and glad to still be here in New York and working with everybody. Um, I'm not the only grandchild here. Aisha is also continuing the family tradition, so some of you know her, and 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 she's doing a doctorate in public health. So we're um, uh, happy to see you, and I'm sure others are on online. Anyway, uh, so. I was thinking about um, when Mary last gave rounds at the HIV Center, uh, Zena was still with us. And 
surprising to no one, Zena had comments. Uh, Zena, grandma, grandma to some of us, Zizi, was famous for many things. And in these circles, one of those certainly was always asking thoughtful questions. And she had a deep connection with Mary that I think began at Columbia and continued during Mary's work in Zimbabwe for many years. And so, of course, when Mary gave rounds in 2020, um, Grandma made an effort to get online, to get on the Zoom with, I'm sure, some help from Ruth. Um, and, and it was really moving and, and important rounds at that point where Mary uh, detailed the uh, racial and ethnic disparities in, in HIV and COVID epidemics and made the case for advocacy to address structural racism, right, before many others were, were calling this out. And I think that article was later published or, or something growing from that in the New England Journal. Um, and so, of course, Grandma wrote a quick note and she says, uh, I'll paraphrase some of it. She says, what a great lecture. I remember Mervyn wrote a far simpler paper on social factors and health, which was regarded as very innovative at the time and hard to publish. Keep it up, Mary. Love, Zena. I'm 98 and a half. How's that? Uh, by the way, that paper was published uh, in 1964 in The Lancet, so they, they managed. So through her work, her questions, and even her emails, Zena forever changed the way many of us see the world, the way we go about our research, and as Bob said, even live our lives. I can still hear her voice. Keep it up, Mary. And to all of us too, to keep up this important work. And then shifting gears a bit for us in the family, um, you know, we, we also were, were, were separated a bit during the pandemic and, and Zena started to share some of her short stories on short, short stories uh, on email. So here's a quick one where she tells about her older brother, Sylvester, who also had a remarkable life journalist, realtor, many successful professions, but became a remarkable runner later in life. He, in fact, won the gold medal in the 200 meter World Veteran Games in New Zealand. So she had competition in the family for, um, but he gave up competitive athletics in the eighties, famously lamenting that there was no one left to run against. <laughs> so this is about his early days and, and Zena writes, also Sill was a very good runner at the little school. There was a sports day and I was taken along. The chief event for us was to see Sill win. Then came his event. He was running great and I was shouting, but then he looked back. So he didn't win the race. We always talked about it, never look back. So when I like to think about this story and how Zena really brought this attitude to all her endeavors from her co-founding of the center uh, and the epidoctoral program to helping to end apartheid in South Africa to the fight for HIV prevention and treatment, especially for women, this spirit of pressing on, keeping going, never looking back. And so now as I turn it over to Gina, we all look to Mary who's really a living model of this kind of socially directed scholarship. So thank you and looking forward to the talk today. Good morning. Inspirational, transformational, iconic and legendary, not only to find Zena, but also our keynote speaker, Dr. Mary Bassett, director, of the Francois Xavier Bognard Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Courageously, she served as New York State's Health Commissioner. Before Harvard, she was Commissioner of New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Bassett has served as the medical faculty, the University of Zimbabwe. She's held positions, the Rockefeller Foundation, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and of course, our own Mailman School of Public Health, where she received the Frank Calderon Prize for her many contributions in public health, including elevating race as a role and a driver 
of health disparities, a theme you can see not only in Zena's work, but also in our HIV center. Dr. Bassett received her BA in history and science from Harvard University, an MD from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, and an MPH from the University of Washington. Born and raised in New York City, welcome on the steamy warm day, Dr. Mary Bassett. Uh, thank you. It was just wonderful to hear all these remarks and um, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, I have to warn everybody that my talk will take about an hour, so we may end up with no time for questions. Maybe I can race through it, but it was uh, absolutely wonderful to hear all the comments and I am thrilled to be here uh, to have the opportunity to deliver this talk. Uh, and to honor the memory of Zena Stain. Uh, my title highlights what I continue to see as the most important um, contribution of epidemiology. And Zena, of course, was eulogized as an epidemiologist. Uh, it provides a map of where, when, and among whom the larger share of the burden of disease falls and when what we call descriptive epidemiology, the, the simple stuff of epidemiology. And these facts set the stage for action. Without these facts, public health officials don't know where we are or how well we're doing. At the New York City Health Department, when I was commissioner, I used to tell staff that I would cut programs before I would cut the department's surveillance activities because these are a unique and core function of government public health uh, to systematically collect, analyze, interpret, and disseminate data. Uh, these are critical to effective public health interventions. So as we've all heard, uh, Zena lived a very long and very active life and I was among the people who were under her wing. There were a lot of people under Zena's wing uh, large wings, Sid Shapiro said when I described myself as such, a South African colleague of Zena's. But I never actually worked directly with Zena. I never had a formal involvement uh, with the HIV Center, uh, where I, I've long re regarded highly your work and where Zena got to spend very rewarding years in the last chapter of a very storied life. So I came to know her as a scholar as an anti-apartheid activist and epidemiologist who kept an eye on the social context. And she did a lot. She did the, you know, was a driving force of the Dutch famine study, uh, was involved in child development. And she was, of course, part of an amazing team of white South African physicians whose work to improve the health of indigenous African majority led them to become self-taught epidemiologists. Their opposition to South Africa's apartheid regime, which was imposed in 1948, led to their departure from the country of their birth and they later populated academic centers in the UK, the US, and really became leaders in the emerging field of modern social epidemiology. I won't forget, I was a second year medical student when I came across John Castle's paper, The Contribution of the Social Environment to Host Resistance. Those of you who haven't looked at it should look at it now. Um, and I was at Columbia, so I found my way to Mervyn Susser, who told me, aside from mentioning to me that if I was interested in epidemiology, I better understand that it involved math. Thank you. Um, he, he, he also advised me to read Kark's book. All to say that this was a very close-knit intellectual community, one that remained intact even as it became far flung. So I'm um, gonna use that very rather long preamble. Let me see if I can, did I, um, to, um, to say that I, I gave a lot of thought in considering what I wanted to talk about today. And I, I decided that I would focus on what I've come to see as a blind spot in much of the 20th century social epidemiology, a field that shaped me and I hope to contribute to. And that blind spot is an underestimation of the impact of racism and colonialism, which share the ideology of white supremacy. I took hope from this quote from uh, 
Morris's uses of epidemiology, uh, that we ought to engage with big ideas, even when they're complicated. And I'm really kind of thinking out loud. Um, and I hope in conversation with all of you, contact me by email if we run out of time for this talk. The last time I had an actual conversation with Zena was when I gave the Calderon uh, Award Lecture in which I talked about white supremacy. And I remember her questioning me and I got her, I got it kind of nod. I, I, I want to say that white supremacy and the social uh, relations remains largely unexamined in public health generally and neglected in many of the foundational texts of social epidemiology, despite the incalculable impact of this ideology on the systems that govern our health and our lives. And there's still so much to be done to undo their imprint and on our lives and our bodies. It's not so many years since the end of apartheid and of official Jim Crow in the United States. Now, these are big issues, um, but I, I'm gonna focus on these very worrying observations that I'm about to share with you as I obviously am a approaching this with some trepidation because the summer's end found me both preparing this talk and doing a turn as Zia's grandparent. So as you can see, Zia is curious and busy and busying. And when I look at this picture of Zina, um, and I hope nobody in her family takes offense, I, I can't help but remember the lively, lifelong curiosity that she brought to everything and her inextinguishable optimism. So in tribute to this, and before I get to what worries me, I thought I'd better relay a lot of the good news, which all of you probably already know, so I'll whiz through it. Uh, we've seen an enormous decline in, in um, child mortality in the past couple of decades. The century seen the uh, biggest increase in life expectancy that we've ever seen. We've seen HIV mortality and incidents pretty much fall off a cliff. Uh, and when I came back to New York City, uh, I saw the data from 2000 where HIV AIDS ranked as fourth in the leading causes of death for the city. And it's now not even in the top 10. It really, it effectively is, it's actually ranks as 19th in 2020. So these gains uh, were largely delivered through effective technologies, which I take to mean contraception, vaccines, management of childhood illnesses, and for HIV antiretroviral drugs, and they've saved millions of lives. And of course, they built on the momentum that we had from the end of colonial regimes in the 60s, uh, from the great society programs in the US, which included Medicaid and Medicare, uh, and of course, the declaration of Ama'ata. But it would seem that this very narrow approach has worked. And I'm really going to put to you that we should ask the question whether we have in not really addressing the drivers of inequality, has it really worked? And are we where we should be? And that's when the story gets gloomy. This is a graph that shows US life expectancy and it shows that life expectancy is falling. It has been falling for a long time. The US was never uh, doing that well compared to its peer nation, nations, which are shown there in the pale gray. Uh, but it was, you know, never in the top of the pack. Uh, but it is uh, now uh, clearly um, since the 1980s um, uh, has begun a decline, which um, has been persistent. Um, the, um, the issue of the American Journal of Public Health this month has a special section on life expectancy decline. And I hope that it is getting more uh, consideration than we've given it. Um, it really should be causing alarm and it hasn't caused the alarm that it should. This is uh, the path of the United States when you consider how much we spend on health, an even lonelier path. And Stephen Wolf, who many of you may know uh, and who writes the lead article for this um, uh, September's American Journal of Public Health on life expectancy, highlights how we now have 56 nations, not those are not all wealthy nations, 
56 nations surpassed the United States in life expectancy. And uh, this is a complicated concept, life expectancy. Uh, I prefer premature mortality, deaths before the age of 65, but life expectancy is some, something that I think we can all understand. It really is a hypothetical construct of how long we can expect to live. And various people have been trying to highlight how um, how concerning the U.S. experience is. This is a paper um, that was done by Jacob Bohr and others published recently um, that shows how the U.S. has done in terms of mortality compared to the population weighted average of other wealthy countries. And you can see in this graph, I don't think I'll try and point at the graph, but you can see that um, the, U the U.S. was uh, doing uh, below average mortality in the 1940s and 50s, uh, but it then in the 1950s began to approach the middle of the pack, and we have then since been higher than average since the 1980s. And you can see the impact that COVID had more clearly on this slide uh, with a marked increase in mortality all countries uh, experience this increase, but you can see that the U.S. has not pull it, pulled out of this decline, uh, whereas other countries you can see have begun to recover from the mortality impact of COVID. Another way to put this is the number of lives that um, have been lost, uh, that wouldn't have been lost if we had better uh, performance uh, in terms of life expectancy. And this is um, looking at um, missing Americans um, and calculating the number of deaths if we were just in the middle of the pack of other wealthy nations. And you can see that there was a period around 1980 when things looked a little better, uh, but uh, since the 1980s, we've had a growing number of missing Americans. And even before COVID, there were 600,000, actually a bit more than 600,000 missing Americans. And after COVID, we have over a million missing Americans. This is not the 1 million plus number of people who've died from COVID. These are the deaths that are excess deaths that of all causes that wouldn't have occurred if we had better performance in terms of our mortality rates. Now, uh, this is also an important observation. I and mean, this, these are maternal, uh, these are mortality rate ratios uh, that show the distribution of excess death by age. And I just wanna bring your attention to the shape of that curve. We're not seeing this driven by infant deaths, which was a, what accounted for a lot of the gains in life expectancy in the 20th century. We are seeing an excess of risk of death in midlife. Uh, that top line and sort of an ochre color is 2021. And you can see though that since the, uh, since the beginning of this century, uh, the US at all ages, has had higher mortality rates than its peer nations. So not just a problem of, of one time in life, it's across the age spectrum. There's a British journalist um, who also does graphics, who's put this in a different way. Uh, he's compared the United States to England's um, uh, mortality experience and he shows here, um, apparently Blackpool, which I'm not sure you'll be able to see. It's the beige line on, your, on the screen there. Apparently it's like the sick town in England. Um, and it's a, it's a seaside resort. I, I, but anyway, it has the lowest life expectancy in England. And guess what? The United States um, has a life expectancy that now matches that of black pools. And of course, we have variation by geography in our country with West Virginia, um, you know, typically having terrible health outcomes. But the here, the thing to note is that the US is doing worse than virtually all English districts. And he shows this further across the income distribution. So I've shown you how it's across age. And now I'm showing you how across the income distribution, 
uh, the U.S. except um, at the very top 1%, uh, the U.S. is underperforming with respect to England, which is hardly a poster child for health among the um, National Health Service, notwithstanding, which is terrific. Um, they, England has many of the same kinds of policy environment that the U.S. has, but the U.S. has, um, across the income distribution, lower life expectancies. Now, we know that uh, income and, and life expectancy are related. Uh, this is a longstanding observation, but what's important here is how, how much less they protect people until you get to be the very richest 1%. Uh, in the United States. And that's when the US begins to match England. And when you look here, uh, using a technique that I won't say that I can really understand, um, Bern, uh, Murdoch shows that trying to account for parity in buying power of income, uh, that there is a, uh, at any given, uh, at uh, any given income level until you get up to quite high income levels, uh, there's a five year gap in life expectancy in the United States versus England. And uh, it, this was not due to COVID. Um, it was a problem before COVID, even without COVID, the US had, was experiencing a rapid recent decline in life expectancy. And again, I think people trying to sort of raise the alarm in various ways. Uh, um, that uh, this shows the age distribution issue where a five-year-old um, has, uh, has a much higher chances of dying um, than uh, peer countries, whereas 75-year-olds uh, are sort of still with the peer countries in the middle of the pack. So I'm, I'm a lot closer to 75 than I am to five years of age, uh, but this is such a terrible prediction for little Zia. Um, so for all of us, we should be really alarmed at this. Now, the, everything in the United States is racialized. And as you heard from the um, uh, comments at the beginning uh, of this morning, um, I've spent a lot of time in recent years uh, thinking about the impact of racism on health. But the main takeaway from these, um, from th these graphs, which are from the Bohr paper and uh, break down the mortality ratio. So again, this is against the weighted average of the uh, peer nations, uh, 21 other wealthy countries that are mostly in Western Europe and um, North America, parts of Asia. Uh, uh, and so anything above one is, is bad. Uh, and you can see uh, that there's a lot of variation by racial ethnic group, but that's not what's worrying me today. What's worrying me is that virtually all groups are experiencing an increase in, mortal in mortality. Uh, if you look at whites, same thing. Uh, the Asian Pacific Islanders, if we pulled out Pacific Islanders, which one of my fellows has done, they're doing terribly. Uh, so it really is a Asians as a uh, census category that we're seeing protective effects. I, we can all hypothesize what's driving this. But in general, the picture for the uh, United States is across ages, across incomes, and across racial ethnic groups. Now, um, as I've said, everything in the US is racialized. And it was way back in 2015 when Case and Deaton uh, published their first um, uh, sort of clarion call that we had a problem with our white working class. Um, this uh, graph, which is a terrible uh, copy of it, but it uh, was on the front page of the New York Times above the fold. So I, I've been in public life and not enough uh, to know that getting above the fold doesn't happen that often. And that's what it looked like. And I was a New York City health commissioner at the time. And when I looked at this graph, it really bothered me. Um, there were a couple of things about it that bothered me. One is that why are we comparing white Americans to whole countries? I mean, why, why are we saying, you know, the comparator for being white in America is being French, English, German, Canadian. Uh, these are not all uh, purely white countries, by the way. Uh, these, there are U.S. 
um, has its particular history and its particular population. Uh, but the other question is, why are we learning from this that Hispanic Americans, the census category, are doing about the same as the UK? I mean, what was that about? Um, and of course, um, my main question was, where are the Black people? And uh, I asked uh, people at the health department if they could replicate these data, and they did. I think you'll agree this looks like they got the exact same graph. And then I asked them to add the Black people. And this is what the graph looks like. It's not nearly so dramatic. It, is, uh, it shows that mortality um, for people classified as non-Hispanic black, black has been going down. This is good. It shows a very worrying observation, which we have to acknowledge Case and Deaton brought to our attention that there is, these are all in midlife, 45 to 54 year olds. Uh, but I mean, look at the gap. And in fact, they, they said that they couldn't fit black people in the graph. And you know, so that's why it wasn't there. And so we still see this enduring impact. So here we are uh, with this um, uh, sort of summary of these, I'm kind of obsessed with this problem. Um, and um, because I, you know, we don't see this very often uh, in world history, uh, the decline in life expectancy during peacetime. And it's been long-term we saw first a stagnation and then a decline, and it's across all these groups, as I've already said. And in the US, it's racialized. And now I'm going back to the South African epidemiologist, and I, let me just had to show. Uh, this is Zena with Mervyn, her life partner, long-term collaborator. And these are some of the other people who they worked with. In the middle there are Sydney and Emily Carp, who really were the mentors, John Castle and uh, Joe Abramson. I, I spent all of his working life actually in South Africa and then Jerusalem. Um, he, um, I used his book when I taught at the University of Zimbabwe. And the Karks are really seen as the authors of something called community-oriented um, public health and, the, and, uh, and, and primary care care, which really brought together public health and um, personal primary care services. And this is um, a sort of schema that Kark offered for what explained the terrible health of the, um, of the black population based on his experience in rural Falella. And you can see that he at the middle identifies something called the community syndrome and he attributes it to migrant labor basically. Uh, and to the um, to the what it meant to withdraw men uh, from these rural areas, and you know this um, way of thinking, the idea that it was the community that was the patient and not just the individuals who walked into the clinic. Uh, I can't uh, overestimate how important it's been, but I really want to highlight a paper that he wrote, uh, and this is a table that came from that paper uh, called The Social Pathology of Syphilis um, in Africans that was published in the South African Medical Journal. And he published this in 49. This is just one year after the National Party uh, won uh, uh, authority and was able to impose formal apartheid. And he took a whole bunch of surveys and put them all together and found very high rates of syphilis in the African population. And he uh, concluded this. He no noted that before um, the advent of European contact that there had been no syphilis in these communities. Uh, and he dismissed the idea that these infection rates were due to some form of racial susceptibility, either cultural or biological, and attributed it instead to the migrant labor system and to the masses of men leaving their homes every year. So this iconic paper was published in, republished in 2003. Dr. Susser, uh, the younger, um, uh, wrote, uh, well, there are a lot of Dr. Sussers in the room, so excuse me, pardon, uh, but Ezra and Landon Myers wrote a paper called The Social Pathology of HIV. I think anybody reading this quote will see that the exact same set of dynamics held when we saw uh, HIV burst on the scene and burst on the scene it did. This is a paper from very early in the epidemic. 
uh, done by uh, uh, Jonathan Mann, um, the first report that I recall uh, of, um, of HIV in Africa. Um, this was the former uh, Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it showed what would become um, a commonly made observation that female uh, infection uh, was uh, higher in younger age groups. So you can see here that under the age of 35, the number of, of females with HIV AIDS, in this case, far outstripped uh, the number with um, uh, of men. And uh, this was reported later from Uganda. Those of you who are familiar with Africa know that these are completely different axes of trade and commerce, uh, but the same pattern was observed uh, with much higher uh, infection rates. Uh, and this is HIV uh, seroprevalence in younger women. So it shifted to younger ages. And additionally, uh, in this paper, they raised the specter that there was a greater susceptibility to HIV among women uh, than among men, uh, positing that it could be either biological or cultural or both um, likely, uh, so that the number of infected women outweighed, uh, outnumbered the number of infected um, men. I think I'm doing okay for time, so maybe I'll slow down a bit. <laughs> So this is a screenshot from the, something that uh, Koresh Abdul Karim uh, showed. Um, and it shows the same female um, shift to younger ages. And then uh, in data put together by Caprissa, which is allied to the, um, to the center and to Columbia University, uh, really marked excess among women as compared to men. Uh, numerically, and these data were all being published um, later than they were being talked about. So everyone knew about these findings, and Zena got to work and published this paper in 1990. Uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that this really launched the movement, and it was a movement, remains a movement, that women needed more methods. Um, so she took those data uh, that I've shown you, and she turned them into action. Uh, this paper was published in 1990, and it took a while. Um, that's 41 years, as to be exact. Um, and we now have WHO um, has recommended, and several countries, at least Zimbabwe and South Africa, have actually approved for uh, distribution. Uh, a vaginal, um, an antiviral, antiretroviral containing vaginal ring um, that will have a substantial, um, so that women put it in, it lasts for a month and it can reduce in trials from somewhere a quarter to a third, uh, but maybe even higher um, uh, as much as a half. Um, uh, interestingly, and people in the room and online may know about this more than I do, the FDA uh, discouraged uh, application for approval of this product in the United States, um, but it has uh, uh, already made it through the regulatory approval process in at least some African countries. And um, it gives women something that they can use, um, maybe not clandestinely, um, but something that they can use without it being very obvious. Um, and uh, you know has the chance to reduce transmission by as much as 50%, which of course is about the same as we could get from ensuring that girls got to finish secondary school. So uh, the uh, innovation in, um, in drugs, um, antiretrovirals um, continues and it needs to continue. Uh, because the number of new HIV infections has sort of stagnated, and we still have far too many every year. Um, there's a lot of excitement, I think appropriately, uh, for a long-acting product for prevention that's injectable. Um, it would overcome the many challenges to adherence that taking a pill every day faces among everyone. Uh, I hope everybody is aware that there never been data to show that adherence was driven by education or social class. It's driven by the simplicity of the regimen. 
um, and uh, taking a pill every day is not a simple matter. So we're all hopeful. Uh, I'm hopeful that this will become widely available, but it's really expensive. It's even at the concessionary price that have been offered by uh, the manufacturer. Uh, it's too expensive. Uh, and of course, there are also production capacity problems and a lot of concern that this will only be available uh, to the privileged North and not to the place where most HIV infections are occurring. Uh, advocacy got us to antiretroviral treatment and I'm hopeful that advocacy will overcome this problem, but I don't know. But in any case, we've seen this huge decline in the impact of HIV, um, uh, both in infections and in, um, and in death uh, that is related to the use of antiretroviral drugs, uh, whether they're taken orally or whether they're administered um, as I hope they will be both for treatment and, and prevention um, with uh, injections. And, you know, the number of lives saved can't be minimized. Um, but um, we still should ask the question whether, you know, all of our talking, and I participated in this, about the structural drivers of risk have really made much difference to our prevention interventions. For sure, they have helped to mitigate the idea that individuals were responsible for their infection. They helped to create the uh, appropriate um, context in which individual risk takes place. Uh, but um, for example, in Zimbabwe, I and others showed that home ownership was an important protect, protector against HIV infection. If you uh, owned a home, you were far less likely to acquire HIV. We also showed that men living apart from their wives was an important risk factor back as it was with syphilis. But uh, aside from a few experiments, looking at education of girls, incentivizing education of girls, or even incentivizing income, then really the breakthroughs have been pharmaceutical and advocacy efforts have focused on access, making these medications available. Um, but there's a problem, which I, um, I, I think we all have to see because the data show it to us, that despite the decline in incidence and death, we are still seeing pretty much the same pattern of the impact of HIV uh, that we saw when this all began. Um, it's declined substantially, uh, but uh, we still have Africa globally accounting for about two thirds of the cases. And we still have girls having much higher risk than their male counterparts. So. This is where we are. Um, and uh, as we've seen that dramatic initial decline, we've seen this tapering. And the question needs to be asked whether we have to return to these structural ideas that I, this is a paper I wrote with a colleague who's a sociologist at the University of Zimbabwe back, back in 19, I can't see it here, but I think it was 1991. Uh, in which we identified patriarchy, forced separation of men from their families as key uh, drivers of uh, promoting the occurrence of transactional uh, sex. And, and we tried to make clear uh, the impact of colonialism on this in our how we wrote about it. Uh, we pointed out that traditional society was indeed patriarchal. Most of Southern Africa is deeply patriarchal. But when the Europeans got a hold of traditional law, they made it worse. And they further deprived women of legal rights that they had had under traditional practices before colonialism. And of course, um, traditional life completely ceased to exist. It, talking about traditional life was talking about traditional life as it occurred in the setting of colonial settlement. Um, that included the land expropriation, forced entry into the cash economy, which was literally forced. You had to have cash to pay various taxes. And of course, under all this was the, the carve up of Africa, uh, which occurred at the end of the 19th century and has been extremely 
um, damaging. My phone is turned off. So uh, the um, the uh, I think I heard on on the BBC that there have been eight military coups in the past three years in Africa. Uh, so military mobilization is a growing growing, not a declining problem. So here are is the graph, but here are the things that Kark left out. He talked about men being away from home. True, uh, but he left out colonialism. Uh, now, I, I've said he wrote this in 1949. It was courageous even to lay uh, the risks of disease at the at the uh, door of the migrant labor system, uh, but it didn't include uh, how this, how extensively this worked, that it was land hunger and the loss of traditional cultivation uh, practices that led to some of the um, uh, things that he noted about agricultural practices and low food production, uh, that men weren't just moving around they were forced to move in order to meet their obligations to the colonial authorities and to care for their families. Uh, and of course, in South Africa under apartheid, uh, which he saw coming and he was there as it began, uh, the racialization of everyday life was complete. Um, and, uh, and the African population was disenfranchised. So I'm gonna say a little bit now about the US. Uh, now I'm talking about things that I've been involved with much more recently than in work with HIV, which I really left when I uh, returned to the United States in 2002. Um, these are books that I read when I decided I would go into public health because I was training at Harlem Hospital and I only saw people getting sicker. I, I uh, you know, we patched people up, we sent them out and they came back and they were sicker. And I decided that if I cared about the health of this community, an idea that I had learned from reading about community-oriented primary care, uh, what we were doing in the hospital wasn't getting us very far. Um, so I started reading, um, and probably of the books that I read, uh, the one that was most important to me uh, was the one by George Rosen here. Um, but I, I already knew some things. Uh, one was in Harlem at the time that I trained, uh, a man was less likely to make it to the age of 65 than a man in, in Bangladesh. This was actually, this made it to the front page of the New York Times. Um, uh, but it was also true as Evelyn Hammonds pointed out to me and she's a historian of science at, at, um, at, at Harvard. Um, that there's not been a single year uh, since colonial times in the United States when black people haven't been sicker and died younger than whites. So anyway, I, I found these books and I read these books, the history of public health like later eras in, of epidemiology was extremely ambitious in its scope. It starts from the ancient times and extends to the modern era. And George Rosen said lots of really important things. He pointed out, that uh, human beings are both social and biological beings and therefore diseases were both social and biological, which at the time of, as a medical student was sort of um, something that I found revelatory. Um, and he said, and I'm gonna read his quote, history performs a social task. It may be regarded as a collective memory of the human group for good or evil, and it helps mold collective consciousness. So he also believed that collective action what was, what was what was needed to advance public health. So I was really smitten by all of these people. Um, and it was only been recent that I realized that all of these social reformers who I admired so, Leona Baumgartner, arguably in my book anyway, the most powerful, health commissioner in New York City in the 20th century, George Rosen, um, uh, even Jane Addams uh, of Hull House fame, um, really based their learnings about public health on the European immigrant experience. They scarcely recognized or referenced the population of African descent in the United States. 
the descendants of the enslaved who were living in truly desperate squalid condition. Jane Addams, um, revered founder of social work, um, said some really regrettable things. Uh, she pointed out, uh, for example, that the settlement house model was appropriate for European immigrants who faced trauma due to their experience of emigration, but came from civilized societies, but were not appropriate for the black population, uh, which did not, which came from societies that were backwards. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing her, uh, but that's what she said. Actually, she said it in the NAACP crisis magazine, go figure, um, but she wrote it and I guess she said it. And of course, Rosen, um, writing about the history of public health in the United States, uh, hardly mentioned Black people at all. So this is at best a blind spot, or perhaps it's the way in which the notion of the perpetual inferiority of the descendants of the enslaved has infused our intellectual life. And maybe novelists or historians or anthropologists are the best placed to comment on that. Morris, who I quoted, he wrote a very slim book on the uses of epidemiology. Well, you can't tell. It's, you can't tell that it's slim. Um, that, um, you know, that, that literature helps us understand things. Um, but I, I'm going to go forward with that concern now uh, because HIV is totally racialized. And you all know that. Um, these are um, pretty recent data um, showing that uh, huge overrepresentation of people classified as black uh, or Latino, uh, showing substantial uh, overrepresentation among people living, uh, acquiring HIV. Uh, this is a graph uh, that I had somebody make for me. Um, and I, I don't think you can, you may not be able to read it, but I think everybody can guess what that top line, who that top line represents. So, I mean, the gap has narrowed, uh, but it remains so substantial and leveling um, of black people compared to everybody else. Um, so we have to start asking the question, what is it that drives um, the particular position of people of African descent uh, and particularly descendants of the enslaved in the United States. Uh, this is a graph um, that shows the distribution of people living with HIV in, um, in, the, United, in, in the United States. The darker the color, the higher the numbers. This, this is a numbers graph, not, not an incidence graph. Uh, but you, you can see and this was surprising to me, uh, all of you probably know it very well, that it's the South, which is still where the majority of the black population in the United States lives. This also surprised me a bit, and I should know this, that over half the black population remains in the US South. And that corresponds to the slave states, the states that comprise the Confederacy, um, and uh, fought in the bloodiest war this country has seen to preserve the capacity to enslave human beings. So also in access to treatment, um, and I have to apologize that this graph, also, which I also had somebody make for me, is mislabeled. That's on the y-axis should be ratio, uh, but this is the number of people um, uh, it's sort of prepped to need the number of new HIV infections divide, um, is the denominator and the number of PrEP prescriptions is the numerator. And you can see the sort of, well, it's not high enough among anybody, uh, but um, which is why we need uh, this long acting. But you can see in the top line, which is white people, uh, a sort of soaring up of uh, PrEP to need ratio. And again, the purple line at the bottom um, now, we can invoke all kinds of things. We can talk about stigma, we can talk about access, uh, but we also have to talk about racism, and uh, which of course is antecedent um, to these issues of access and 
um, and stigma. Uh, so this takes me to a little bit of history. Um, and uh, I talk about this a lot. Uh, we've all learned more history since uh, the murder of George Floyd. I think everybody has learned more about the history of the United States. But you all know that um, 1619, actually, the School of Public Health commemorated the 400th uh, uh, year since 1619 uh, was the year when the first captive Africans um, were acquired by the settlers at Jamestown. You know that all of the original states allowed people to be enslaved. And this is the important point here, that this was not a bad sort of a nightmarish sideshow to U.S. history. This was um, key to the enormous uh, and accelerated emergence of the United States as an economic power. The use of an unpaid workforce um, and the acquisition of native lands. Um, and I haven't talked much, but I hope you notice that Native American Indians and have had the worst mortality experience. I don't know if anybody noticed that. Um, and had the worst experience during COVID, by the way. Um, uh, uh, these were the engines of the US economic growth. And this is what I'm thinking about, that these historical facts have allowed a particularly predatory form of capitalism to emerge in the United States, one that is now harming all of us, regardless of our racial ethnic classification, our income, unless you're up there at the 1% uh, or our age. And, you know, the um, transatlantic slave trade went on for a long time. Um, it was lethal. And this is what I didn't know till I saw this map, that skinny arrow going to the United States, under 5% of people taken out of Africa actually were deposited in the United States. Uh, and the uh, fact that there were 4 million people enslaved at emancipation in 1865 was due to the natural growth of the population and the requirement that everybody who was descended from an enslaved person remain enslaved regardless of their parentage. So um, the uh, meaning regardless of the men who really left the white men who fathered uh, these children. Um, and of course, uh, the US received enslaved people from the Caribbean, uh, which was a site for seasoning. Uh, so this was an extraordinarily brutal system um, that um, led to high mortality rates in the crossing. You'd wonder why when enslaved people were worth so much. Um, a historian said to me that it was sort of getting people ready uh, to the fact that you will die if you don't submit. Um, so uh, this is a graph that I often spend quite a lot of time talking about, but um, it was created by an artist in Baltimore. And really what I want you to focus on is what the author of this, the artist um, uh, wanted people to see, that out of these many years, how few of them are in the green. Uh, whether you started with the 54 when school desegregation occurred or started in the mid 60s when voting rights were finally extended to all people um, in the United States. Um, it, it hasn't been that long. Uh, and how can we not talk about this? Um, and how can we not seek ways uh, and use the skills that we have in public health and epidemiology to try to understand how this made it into people's bodies um, and created risk. Um, ev everybody talks about structural racism now. It was in the president's inaugural address. Um, but um, actually, Phil, as you mentioned, uh, I and others at the city health department began writing about this nearly 10 years ago. And um, the important thing here is that 
racism works in through many channels, um, but it doesn't require individual prejudice to work. That that's why we call it structural, uh, because it can work. People say silently. Um, so it affects the people who are subject to it, who internalize beliefs about them. Uh, these tragic um, outcome of the the Clark's uh, study um, in which children were asked to pick a doll, black children and pick the white doll. Uh, what most of us think about is interpersonal racism, prejudice behavior between individuals or institutional racism, which I think frankly helps explain what we all look like here today. Um, but I consider these really antecedent um, to the social determinants of health. Um, and they, you know, very often people try to talk about racism as and um, as simply a sort of a marker of of um, of poverty. Uh, and that is an important way that racism works. Uh, but it it does more than that. Um, so the idea here is that just about anything you can think of that you think of as a risk, you can ask yourselves, how does racism, how can we, what happens if we seek to stratify this by, by, um, by race? So all of these pathways are ways in which racism functions and many of them are increasing. Um, and not going in the right direction. Um, so, you know, we know that New York City is a very segregated city. Um, this is a graph using the Census Dissimilarity Index, and I'm going to flash through these and just keep an eye on the areas that are dark uh, colored. Uh, those are areas that have a higher proportion of non-white population. And I used to always call this like the health effects of poverty, because these are all poor neighborhoods. In uh, New York City, the South Bronx, uh, for example, is uh, one of the poorest geographies in the United States, at least it has been. Um, but when you think about poverty and race in New York, they're collinear, as the epidemiologists would say. Um, they're pretty close together. And now I think of these patterns as the health effects of racism. These are very different outcomes, asthma, HIV, ho drug hospitalizations. And I think you'll see that the same parts of the city, these highly segregated uh, parts of the city, um, uh, which uh, have concentrated people of color are, are the ones that have the higher burden. And it's not just health outcomes. It's all kinds of things. Just think about just about anything. Um, and some of them are things that don't, aren't controlled by individuals, housing quality, uh, parks, food availability, uh, which I haven't shown here. Um, those all uh, also track with these same areas. And it's, I've often used, and I won't go through it now, so we have a few minutes for question, use redlining as an example of um, of um, structural racism uh, because it included the banks, the landowners, the homeowners associations, the all of these um, were affected by these maps that were instituted by government um, and uh, basically made certain parts of the country, nearly 240 cities uh, were affected. Uh, so uh, it didn't matter if the banker didn't like you, uh, you weren't getting that loan. And um, that is a, an important driver. And one of the reasons that government is, um, is, has to be held to account, uh, not just the banks and the, um, and the homeowners association, but the actions by government that made this possible. So as you've gathered, I'm really scared about these life expectancy data. Um, we saw this decline in the former Soviet Union uh, before it collapsed. Uh, it was seen uh, 
across Africa and many countries with the um, impact of HIV AIDS um, at the time an unprecedented uh, global pandemic. Uh, but I would put to you that it's possible that racism has made palatable policy interventions that are harmful to everyone. And it's also true that despite the passage of time and the advent of progress, we continue to see these huge gaps. If we extended out the line, it would just take too long to eliminate the gap. And if we accept that we are all human, that these gaps have no reason to exist on the basis of biology, um, we have to do more. And um, I've become late in my working life, uh, somebody who advocates for reparations um, for African enslavement. And I'm sure there are cases to be made uh, for people who's colonized people, including the indigenous people of this uh, continent. Um, but let me end with how the last book of uh, Zena's and, um, and Mervyn's uh, Years of Epidemiology um, challenged us all. Uh, they pointed out um, that in looking through the evolution of epidemiology and proclaiming that the era of looking at individual risk factors was over, uh, that we needed to start thinking on more levels, um, um, that they um, were leaving to all of us, um, their successors, to open the door. So we're all now living in the future that they knew they would not see. It is a frightening future. I haven't even mentioned climate crisis, uh, but it is one in which I'm confident uh, we can bring to bear our efforts as people who work in public health because these findings should be of concern to us all. Um, how long we live um, is something that we all have to protect for ourselves, for little Zia. Um, and with that, let me just thank you and see if we can have some time.